Welcome to Come Follow Me. Today we're going to talk about Alma, uh, chapter 36 to 38. Right. What? This is an interesting area in the Book of Mormon. They all are, right? But you get to hear some councils. You know, we're, we're supposed to counsel, and these are individual councils. You see Alma counsel with each of his three sons. Now, we do not study Corianton this week. He'll be next week. But we get to hear his counsel to Helaman, who becomes the next record keeper, the next prophet. His counsel to Shiblon, 15 verses, but just such a good, faithful son that there is so much to, to strive for to even be like a Shiblon, right? Everybody thinks about the Almas and the Helamans and the Moronis. And, but here's Shiblon, kind of like Sam. Great guy. Great guy. And so we're going to get a little bit of what he shares with his sons. And he starts off by saying, remember. Yes. It might be the most important word in the scriptures. Remember. Because when we remember, we're able to make better decisions. We're able to be more discerning about what's happening around us. And so he wants them to remember the captivity of their fathers. And then, interestingly enough, with both Helaman and Corianter, Corianton, no, Shiblon, Shiblon, with both Helaman and Shiblon, he gives similar counsel right at the beginning. So if you were to look at 36, verse 3, or 38, verse 5, you find that he gives almost identical counsel. He does make one word change, and I think the word change is interesting too. To Shiblon, he says, remember, there's that remember word, as much as ye shall put your trust in God, even so much ye shall be delivered out of your trials and your troubles and your afflictions, and ye shall be lifted up at the last day. To Helaman, he says, I do know that whosoever shall put their trust in God shall be supported in their trials. To Shiblon, he said, delivered. To Helaman, he said, supported. supported. Supported in their trials and their troubles and their afflictions and shall be lifted up at the last day. That was important to Alma to make sure these sons know this. Putting your trust in God. Life is tenuous. Life has trials and challenges and afflictions, right? And so we need to know that when we put our trust in God, we're supported, we're delivered, and even more importantly, we receive that blessing of being lifted up at the last day. I want that one. Yeah. I want that one, yeah? It's important. So I just wanted to bring that out a little bit. And then he goes through his conversion. He talks about the angel repenting the sweetness the bitterness right mm -hmm. and I think I wonder sometimes as parents and I'm gonna kind of give this challenge to you if you're watching as parents do you share enough with your children your testimony what you know is true how you know it's true the process you've gone through because he keeps telling them I know this of the spirit not of myself I know this by the Spirit. He has received his testimony. He is converted. We see that through his life. But what kinds of thoughts did you have as you were reading through this part in Alma 36, talking well, about his repentance? to go with what you said, um, you know, when you were talking about do you share enough with your children your experiences, you know, you're the example for your children. Right. And so when you share those things, they learn, you know, like when you share like um when you share things like you know i am so sorry that i did this it mm -hmm. was a mistake that i made then they learn to say to you i am so sorry that i did that because right so you just you learn from your child through mm -hmm. your yeah you so as a parent the the job is do the best you can because your kids are watching <laughs> yeah. your children are watching and so your example good or bad has an effect and as parents we're very very aware of that and recognize that we won't do everything perfectly. That's not possible. But that need to repent is also real for parents too. Catherine, I saw you get excited over there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. So mine is in verse 17. Okay. And 
he says that he remembered his father prophesying. Ah, yes. And, and remembering the words of his fathers. Now, that's the other thing as a parent, too. Sometimes we feel like what we say is not being heard. We do. We feel like, and, and you got, you're good kids. I don't generally have that difficulty with you. But I have had experiences where I just feel like nothing I'm saying is getting through with, with, with children, teens, older children that we have. And I'll bet Alma the Elder often felt like Alma the Younger was not listening. <laughs> and yet right here, when he's going through this repentance process, I remembered the words which my father had spoken. That was really important. Actually, he heard his father prophesy concerning the coming of one Jesus Christ to atone for the sins of the world. So because he had talked of Christ's atonement, his son knew what to do. You know, what's what's kind of our theme scripture? Second Nephi 25, right? It's in 25 and it's verse 26. We talk of Christ. We preach, preach of Christ, Christ we, we rejoice cry of Christ, we rejoice <laughs> in Christ. Christ. I've got it all out of order. That our children may know to whom they may look for remission of their sins. Right? I think it's very important because Alma the Younger was able to see his father not only that, but teaching the gospel mm -hmm. to the people in the waters of Mormon and also to teach him the principles of the gospel. Right. So right. it was very important. Right. And you know he taught his children, too. It's not a matter of not teaching your children. Children make choices. Don't do the bad things. <laughs> Just shake my finger at you. <laughs> Anything else you guys thought as you were going through this and, and want to discuss with this? I loved verse 11. Mm -hmm. And it kind of just stood out, stood out to me because he says that after I technically fell unconscious for about three days, but... He says, after I fell to the earth, I was unhearing and, and unseeing, mm -hmm. but the angel said more. Okay. That he didn't hear, but the sons of Mosiah did. Right. And I always thought that was interesting because, like, we don't often think about how uh, the angel said more. He said that after he heard, but if thou wilt destroy thyself, seek no more to destroy the church. Mm -hmm. And he fell down and passed out. Mm -hmm. And then the angel said more, but we don't get more of that when nope. we not get told us. the story. It might so. be in those other plates. Yeah, we have the book of Alma, <laughs> but not the book of the sons of Messiah. That's right. We don't have their record. But that's true. We don't get that because it was enough to him. It was shocking enough to go, you're going to be destroyed, basically. <laughs> oh, well, that was not my goal in life. <laughs> was not what I was after here. Right, and so something about that, you know, so somebody can have that kind of an experience and not repent. Mm -hmm. We know that firsthand just from reading about Laman and Lemuel. They had plenty of experiences that should have brought them to the same point. Something in Alma was different than Laman and Lemuel. That when that moment of truth came, he went, whoa, I need to stop. I need to turn myself around. But he spent three days in awful torment, remembering everything he'd ever done, wishing to be just non-existent, to disappear because of how that made him feel. Sounds Brilliant. like an awful experience. It is, isn't it? One of the things that really struck me is the fact that he found it very important to share this experience with um, Helaman and Shiblon. Mm -hmm. And he shared very specifically the pain of sin, but then also the joy in repentance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think we forget sometimes like, yeah, th there's pain and sin, but like there's also the joy of repentance and we truly repent and turn our lives to God, how that will wash away that pain. Right. So that we can feel that joy. That is the blessing of Jesus Christ's atonement. And that's what he remembered there in the midst of that after three days and three nights, right? And so he remembers what his father taught. And then, why do I have fruit on the table? Why do I have Wait. bitter greens okay. on the table? <laughs> why, why did we put these out here today? Because what does he say in verse 21? 
that nothing could be so bitter as the, his pains and sins, and nothing was as ex- exquisite or sweet as his joy. Yeah, exquisite bitterness and exquisite sweetness. So you know how we challenged you to plant, you know, some seeds the other day? Well, eventually that can grow and mm-hmm. it can produce things. like, right. And so we have some bitter and sweet things on the table. Right, exactly. So these are all things you might find. Well, this you'll probably find in your grass somewhere. This is dandelions. And they're edible. Surprise. And they're actually good for your body. They taste... Awful. Awful. <laughs> the flowers are sweet. They are bitter. The flowers are sweet. But this is not. The leaves this are is not a bitter so. herb. <laughs> and it's a cleansing herb, like repentance is cleansing. This is kale. Now this you'd have to grow on purpose. It doesn't and it's getting kind of limp because it's been in the fridge for a day or two. Usually it's quite stiff. But these are bitter, one more than the other. Kale is not nearly as bitter as dandelion. But they're bitter. And so I want you to take a piece of bitter herb. Take one and pass it down. Just take one. Just one. I'm trying to only take one. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) I want you to taste the bitter. Now you could also do this with baking chocolate. You've all done that. Oh, that was bad. That's bitter. Ew. That's bitter. Yeah, that's oh, it just bitter. hit me. <laughs> mm. Oh. Mm. It's not good. We should have brought water down. <laughs> that's bitter. Okay? That's a that's an experience. It's not sour, right? Ah. Oh. This would make you cringe, but you wouldn't be doing this little shuddering thing yeah. over there. Mm-hmm. Now, I would not peel and eat a lemon. You but know, I might take a lemon over a dandelion. <laughs> uh-huh. And so think about that bitterness. Think about what sin is really like in the end. Sometimes when we talk about it, we realize that there is... They enjoy it for a season. That's what the scriptures talk about. But in the end, it always brings you to bitterness. It always brings you bitterness. Now, if that bitterness leads you to repentance, then you get the sweet. Then you get the joy. Yes, Catherine? Like, when you eat the dandelion, at first it doesn't really taste like anything. Then all of a sudden it hits you. Mm -hmm. Now, these are raspberries just picked out of the yard. Anybody want a raspberry? Yes. Yes. Okay, at least to kill that bitter taste. Look, taste the difference between sweet Right? And these are picked right off the plant, and they're fresh. Emma just picked them right before we started. So these are the sweet ones. These are the good, ripe, sweet raspberries. There are some big ones. And that's purple. It's going to be really sweet. Oh, that that helps so much better. <laughs> <laughs> now look at those faces. Look at the difference in these faces. Like, woo! <laughs> Pass them along. Yeah, I've still got this bitter taste in my mouth, guys. Come on. So I tried to wash it down. <laughs> Did you eat your bitter? Yes, I it did. Bitter. Mmm, <laughs> much better. I know. You know, if you don't repent, you kind of just have this nasty aftertaste stuck left in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> See, there's all sorts of conclusions you can draw. Let's eat them afterwards. But you know, you can just any fruit. There's a banana. There's a mango. There's apples. There's an apricot off the tree outside because it's apricot season. At least at our house, it is. And so there's two apricots. Is there two apricots? Okay, two apricots. You know, even in 3024, he talks about the that he labored from that time without ceasing, hoping to bring other souls to repentance. Now, there is a bitterness as you begin the repentance process, because that's kind of when you realize, I need to make a change, right? But what he says is that I might bring them to taste. I love the word taste. You have a taste, right? To taste that they might also be born of God and be bi- filled. Oh, sorry. The taste of the exceeding joy, which I did taste, that they might also be born of God and be filled with the Holy Ghost. So he's equating that joy with this sweetness, right? Good. Also, um, 
So he talks about, so the scriptures talk about the joy of bringing just one soul to Christ. Right. So just imagine the joy of bringing many. Yes. And it's once again with that joy and that sweetness and yes. that happiness. Also, real fast, the thing I wanted to share about his experience and mm -hmm. everything. So it says that he had an, um, sorry, let me just read it. And I was racked with eternal torment, for my soul was harrowed up to the greatest degree of wrecked with my sins. Yeah. Now that is that, there's that harrowing experience again, right? We know what a harrow is. It just breaks up those clods of dirt. Thinking of that <laughs> on your soul is, <laughs> I think it just gives me a little and shudder. And also, <laughs> in the Doctrine and Covenants, it talks about endless, um, or I mean eternal punishment. And um, it's from... It's in chapter, mm -hmm. section, section 19, 19. 19. 19. It's from 10 to 12, but it says, For behold, the mystery of... Does that say majesty or mystery? Where are you? Mystery. Mystery of godliness. How great is it? For behold, I am endless, and the punishment which is given... From my, um, from my hand is endless punishment, for endless is my name. Wherefore, eternal punishment is God's punishment. Endless punishment is God's punishment. Right. So endless and eternal are both. It, it's God's name. So when it says endless punishment, it means his punishment. It doesn't mean it's going to go forever and ever and ever. He's endless. Yes. He's eternal. His punishment. Very good point. And I think that that's a very easy thing to be confused Man, about. Could you imagine if you got punished forever? That would be terrible. It would be, wouldn't it? <laughs> wouldn't be very just either, but... No, well, maybe just it is, yes, actually. Uh, it is just. Forever? It's mercy that steps in and saves you. Fair. Okay. It's mercy that steps in and saves you. <laughs> So you have to recognize that. Otherwise, you're in trouble like Corianton, and we'll get to that next week. Yes. <laughs> okay, so let's let's turn now to some other things. We've got his repentance process. We have, we have his testimony. And I was reading the other day, and I shared this with you guys, that when the young men's program started, Brigham Young's instruction to Junius Wells was that he wanted the young men to stand up one at a time in each meeting and bear testimony. And if they didn't all get to it in that meeting and the next meeting, their job was to stand up and bear testimony. He wanted them prepared to testify, to defend, to teach, and this was the process. I think that's something that we should do more in our own home. More testifying, more teaching, more defending of truth, because those are things we need. Those are skills we need to have, something that we really should think a little bit more about. So with that, let's go on now. Let's go to 37. Now here, Helaman is going to become the next keeper of the records and the sacred things and their next prophet, their next high priest leader, right? Um, it's kind of interesting. Sorry if I interrupted you. No, that's you. all right. Um, but it's interesting because it seems like this is just one big giant interview combined with a council. Yes. He's like... You're going to be the next prophet. I need to know a couple things. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. I need to know if you're going to do keep my commandments. He gives him an interesting promise because he's going to talk about the plates now. Mm -hmm. And he's going to talk about how the plates that have holy scriptures written on them, they will retain their brightness. Now, that is not a natural process. Metals corrode. But plates with holy scriptures on, Heavenly Father is going to preserve so that those scriptures are kept. And we know or that. The, or all the scriptures said holy writ. Holy writ, right. And we know that because Joseph Smith received records that were how old? Uh-huh. <laughs> Over a thousand years old, like 1,400 years old. Yeah, 1,400 years old, he receives records that should have been corroded, right? Well, the brass so there's plates that. that he received were from the time of uh, Adam down. And so... Those had a lot of great information in them, not mm -hmm. only of the past, but up to their time. So those things are preserved, but then we have a really interesting verse in um, 6. And Miranda, if you'll bring that out, because this is the verse we're going to recommend that you memorize this week. And it says, 
And now you may suppose that this is foolishness in me, but behold, I say unto you, that by small and simple things are great things brought to pass, and small means, in many instances, doth confound the wise. And you know, something I think is really interesting is we talk about the small, simple things that help us stay on the covenant path mm -hmm. a lot. And sometimes I think we forget because, like, it gets stressed so much, like, do the small and simple things, do the small, simple things. Yeah. But the truth is, if you stop doing it, that's what, that's when you start to drift. That's when you start to slowly wander off. Right. And it's those small and simple things that help keep you on the right track. Yeah. They keep you focused in the right direction. And right? one day those small and simple things will become will build mm -hmm. up and become one great big work. Exactly. So he's going to entrust these records to him, and they are so important. He's got to keep them. He has to preserve them. And he knows, he says, that he may show forth his power unto future generations. Are we not a future generation being blessed by that sacred record? It's that important. And so, it, you know, it's sometimes we may not realize the importance of what we're doing. You keep your journals. Keep your journals. It is a part of how you will be judged. It is a part of how you can bless others in the judgment by writing down the good things you see them do. And so they're very, very important. And so it's also important that it says, if ye transgress the commandments of God, behold, these things which are sacred shall be taken away from you by the power of God. And ye shall be delivered up unto Satan, that he may sift you as chaff before the wind. Can you think of anybody else who had a similar uh, instruction given to him regarding plates? Joseph. Mm -hmm. He was to keep them safe and do everything in his power to keep them safe. And if he didn't, he would be delivered up, right? And so that same, and we even get a little bit of a prophecy of him. If you go into verse 23 through verse 25, 26, he talks about Joseph Smith. He talks about Joseph Smith having a Urim and Thummim in order to be able to interpret the plates. He's told him, don't share the secret combinations of the people of Jared. Go ahead and talk about their wickedness. We need to understand the consequences of that, but don't share the secret combinations. They don't need them. Now we know secret combinations, you're right, we don't need them written down because Satan's really good at revealing them to his followers. They and always come back. They always come back. They always come back because we have that constant reminder, keep the commandments, you'll be preserved. Don't keep the commandments, you won't be preserved. Right? That's the promise of this promised land. Now, something else that, that we have here, and I think, Miranda, you were talking about this earlier, is this need to counsel with the Lord and everything. So, the famous scripture in 35, Oh, remember, my son, and learn wisdom in thy youth. Come on. Yay. Yay. Learn, learn in thy, thy youth, youth to keep, keep the, the commandments, commandments of God. God. Another one good for memorizing. If you'd prefer that one, but we chose a different one this week because we wanted to focus on the small and simple things. This looks so small. And then what's the counsel he gives him then? Um, to do everything for God. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's kind of funny because, like, all the time we talk about, like, you need to do everything for God, but, like, truly, when he's the center of your life, when he's the center... Because the promise in this verse is that when we do all these things for him, is that we'll be lifted up at the last day. When he's the center of your life, you don't want to sin. You don't want to do those bad things. You want to do better. You want to be your best, and mm -hmm. you try to give your best. Mm -hmm. And you're constantly learning where you need to improve. It is so easy to look at someone and say, they're so perfect. They have nothing they can do any better. But it, and, and, and that's okay to have someone that you can look at and go, I'd like to be more like them. But that person can't do that. That person needs to focus on where do I need to improve? Where do I need to be better? Because that is our process. That is our life. And so he says, counsel with the Lord in all thy doings, and he will direct thee for, for good. When thou liest down at night, that he'll watch over you. When you rise in the morning, let your heart be full of thanks to God so that you could be lifted up at the last day. It's really that important. And then he talks about the simpleness of these words and the compass they provide to us. 
And so he harkens back to the Liahona, which was their director in the wilderness. And it was so simple. All they had to do was have faith and follow its directions. Simple. Simple. Jinx. (laughs) All you have to do is have faith and follow its directions. This is this. Is our day Liahona? This is our Liahona. He makes that comparison, Liahona, to the scriptures. Really, really nice visual there. And I really liked it because uh, he says here that by small and simple things, Mm -hmm. the Lord brings about his great purposes. That's right. That's right. And sometimes we're a small and simple thing. But he reminds him, don't be slothful. Don't be lazy because it's so easy. You, you keep up with it. You do it. Now we go into verse chapter 38 and we're going to talk about Shiblon here, right? And Shiblon went on a mission to the Zoramites. So he saw what happened there. He was a good and faithful missionary. He's been a good and faithful son. And that's it's just so beautiful. He says, My son, I trust that I shall have great joy in you because of your steadiness and your faithfulness unto God. For as you have commenced in your youth to look to the Lord your God, even so I hope that you will continue in keeping his commandments, for blessed is he that endureth to the end. When you have a child that tends to make those good choices, they are a comfort. They really are. And that's not that you don't watch over them. He wouldn't spend this time with him if he wasn't, you know, concerned about one or two things and wanting to encourage his continued goodness. And I think it's important to recognize that. But he also, I think you talked about this one earlier, verse 9, Joseph. Oh, yes. He talks about how there is only one way, and that is through Jesus Christ that our um, salvation is brought to pass. Mm -hmm. Because if we are not centering our life around him and his purposes and what he wants us to do then there's not really yeah what's the point yeah and sometimes you have two choices and you need to make a choice between two things that are like a higher law and a lower law what will bless the most people if i do this or if i do this which one's going to bring the most blessing to the most amount of people that one would be the higher way right? Mm-hmm. And so even even those little everyday decisions, which one is the greatest blessing to others? And of course, that blesses us because we need to make sure we're remembering that. But if you want to be thinking of some other names for Jesus Christ, the light of the world, the life of the world, the word of truth, righteousness, those are names of the Savior. You can always interchange words that mean the same thing in the scriptures. And so if you were to take where it says Jesus or Savior or Lord, you know, and and interchange light of the world, or if it says light of the world or word of truth, put his name in there, all of a sudden your understanding of who he is, what he wants us to do, how he acts, increases and how we need to act changes. All right. So then we just, we have one final injunction, which is, Don't Don't pray pray like like the the Zoramites. Zoramites. He went to the Zoramites, right? He knew what that kind of a prayer was like. And Miranda, why not? What is it about that prayer he's warning him about? The Zoramites' prayer was very prideful, and they would thank God that they were better than their brethren. And so he warns Shiblon to be humble. To be humble. And And sober. And sober. So if we go into this a little bit, in verse 12, he reminds him, use boldness but not overbearance. See that ye bridle all your passions, that ye may be filled with love. Okay? Passions can be any strong emotion. Anger, you know, covetousness, lying, any of those kinds of things. Even lustfulness. We often think of lustfulness when we think of passions. But there are a lot of different passions. We must have that in control. A bridle like a horse wears if, if the horse isn't going the way you want it to go, it, it sits right here. And this is a very tender spot on you as well. It's also a tender spot on a horse. And so it doesn't take very much to turn a horse the direction you want them to go. The lightest tap when you have a well-trained horse and they just go the way you want them to go. You don't cause them pain anymore. 
because so, they've learned when you pull that direction, you want me to go that way and I'm going to be obedient. They're bridled, right? Some horses are so trained that they don't even have to have a bit in their mouth. That's right. Even just the halter is enough. And so that training. So we have to train ourselves to bridle our passions. And so that is really, really important. And refrain from idleness. And then he tells him not to pray like the Zoramites because he says... Rather say, forgive my unworthiness and remember my brethren in mercy. Yea, acknowledge your unworthiness before God at all times. We all have things to work on, improve upon. He wants him to remember that. And then his final injunction is be sober. Now, the interesting thing is I looked this word up this morning, the word sober and its definition and if you go to the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, you'll have a definition close to what Joseph Smith's time would have used this as. And you, you can buy the great big thick green one, or you can go online to websters1828.com and look these up. But to be sober is to not be in a fit of passion. And so you have to recognize that soberness is the opposite of being out of control being in control of your passions. So sober is like a bridal. There's another place where you could use that same word. But we know that Mormon was a sober child. He's asking his son to be sober. If you go into the scriptures, into the New Testament, look up 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. He talks about soberness there. Titus 2, verse 12. One of the things that you really ought to do with your scriptures is look for links of other scriptures that teach you the same thing in a, in, with additional information. And so look up those scriptures. Look at what they say about sober there. Look up other scriptures about sober. Because if we're supposed to be a sober people, and we are, and that doesn't mean this, right? <laughs> That's not sober. But not light-minded is sober. Having your passions under control is sober. When something happens... That is not what you would like. How do you respond? Are you sober or passionate? In the wrong way, right? Depends and, on the moment. Right. And so you, those are some really important things. So take a look at those. Go into our blog. Make sure that you are looking at that because we not only have activity ideas in there, but we also have discussion ideas. So make sure that you take some time there in the blog to remind yourself of some of these um, descriptions and discussions, as well as some activities that could be helpful to you and your family. All right, so let's end today. Let's sing again because I love to sing. I think that it helps to teach. It helps to bring the spirit. This one is both a primary song and a hymn song, and it's on page 304, Teach Me to Walk in the Light. At home, sing all three verses. There's so much in there, but... For the sake of time, we're going to sing one. Can you give us our first note, Catherine? Okay, here we go. Teach me to walk in the light of His love. Teach me to pray to my Father above. Teach me to know all the things that are right. If you've enjoyed our videos, give us a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. And don't forget to find and follow us on Facebook.